Hey everyone, let's just jump into Ethereum and the potential of an ETF today. We thought, hey, let's get some Bloomberg guys on here to talk about this a little bit more. It's going to be a good show. You don't want to miss it. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into Tech Path. Joining me today, of course, is James Safer coming over from Bloomberg Intelligence. Great to have you on the show again. Thanks for having me, Paul. Happy to be here. Hey, so James, let's go into a few points just off the top of your head. We'll talk about it in the beginning. I want to get it kind of after we talk about a little bit here, uh, how things, first of all, what would you give the score, uh, you know, one to 10 in terms of the success rate of the Bitcoin ETFs and th how things have gone so far? Is this just overwhelmingly successful or what's your consideration? Yeah, 10, 10 out of 10, 11 out of 10. Um, no, even 10. the worst, okay. even the one with the lo lowest assets, BTCW, um, it's still a tremendously successful product yeah. by pretty much That's any crazy. measure that you can think of for something that just launched a couple of min minutes ago. And then, I mean, a couple of months ago, and you go up to something like IBIT and FBTC, I mean, they're smashing yeah. records all over the place. Like this whole group is just smashing every record we've ever seen. It's crazy. Uh, I heard um, a couple of analysts on yesterday that were looking at this particular situation. One of them said something that was kind of interesting, and that was the whole idea that this may be you know, uncharted water that the street has never seen before, and they don't even really know how to react to it. So I was surprised by that statement. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 like a new uh, regime, I guess you could say. Like, yeah. uh, right, people don't know how to re uh, re respond to it. For the most part, anyone looking at this objectively is saying what I'm saying, right? This is a smashing mm -hmm. success. It's extremely successful. The people still trying to pick holes in this and argue with it, I've like, uh, I don't know what they're stuck on here, right? There's the, the data is the data, and it is what it is. And for the most part, a lot of these people tend to be people who are just anti the crypto world, anti digital assets, and right. they are just projecting that onto ETFs. And like, from my point of view, the ETF is one of the most tried and true um, financial technologies out there for investing. And like, they can basically hold and trade anything. And they're showing they can do that with Bitcoin yep. here. And they've shown they can do it with plenty of other assets in the past. So these people trying to project this onto these ETF wrappers are, uh, they're, they're in for a rude awakening. Even if Bitcoin drops 50% from here, I mean, they still been a smashing success. Yeah, for sure. One thing that is kind of interesting is uh, this statement here from Matt Hogan. Uh, he's talking about who's buying these. And one thing he says, he's talking about this date of May 15th. Let me kind of zoom in on that so you might be able to see it a little bit better. Um, May 15th, investors are <laughs> more than 100 million, 100 million AUM. They file their uh, 13Fs. So we're going to know who's putting cash in this thing. You know, what, do you, what's your, what is Bloomberg's position on this? Where these funds are coming from? Yeah, I mean, the real answer is we don't know. Like Matt said, I've been telling everyone the same thing. Why wait for March, May 15th? We'll see some stuff before then because uh, yeah. the, that's just the deadline, 45 days after a quarter end for those 13F filings. Um, so, But people do submit them earlier, but for the most part, the vast, vast majority are submitted absolutely last minute. So yeah. there's no way for us to know from anecdotal experience that we've heard from the likes of Matt and other other people at issuers, it's runs the gamut. It's advisors, individual advisors, it's retail, um, it's some institutions, it's some funds, mm. it's uh, private equity, um, you name it, type hedge fund type type of people that are owning, buying these things. And also I've talked to people that had like significant allocations to Bitcoin itself and they've decided to sell their Bitcoin and buy these ETFs just because it's better for estate planning and all these different things. Wow. So there's examples okay. of people literally selling their spot products, their spot Bitcoin to buy these ETFs just because it's in the traditional financial ecosystem. They don't mind paying a fee. They don't mind giving up some of the access and ability that you lose when you go to the ETF wrapper. So it really runs the gamut, but we'll get the hard information you're talking about, like Matt put in that tweet on May 15th. Yeah, and we'll, I'll be covering situation. it. I'm waiting for it. I'm, I'm going to write. I'm going to write about it as soon as we see it. So look for something from May 15th. I'll be looking the, the 20th, and we'll be covering it. Yeah, that'll be a good topic. Hey, listen, this is the other scenario that's happening, and that is the lopsided demand versus availability. And you're looking at Bitcoin purchased by ETFs right now. Like this is crazy. Since Monday the, the 11th, okay, 14,000 versus what we could be what could be mined right now, 881. I mean, these numbers do not hold up in a supply and demand world. Uh, where do you think this breaks? And when it does, at some point, it's going to. What happens to these ETFs from both a success side or possibly even a maybe slowing side? 
Yeah, I, I mean, honestly, if you had asked me this a couple of weeks ago, I would have told you I can't imagine this continues to go the way that it's going with flows uh, and even volume. I thought it would slow down and trickle off a little bit after some spikes, and that has not happened, right? Yeah. <laughs> that has not happened at all. If anything, it's, it's accelerated so far. Um, but th I would also say, like, that's also somewhat misleading because the price is – dictated at the margins, right? It's the marginal sure. buyers and sellers that are dictating the price for everyone else. And yeah, obviously that's impactful. That's a, that's the only thing we can really look at, supply and demand. But supply is also coming from people willing to sell their Bitcoin. So if right. you're buying these Bitcoin ETFs, what people just need to understand is you're. it's at the end of the day, whether it happens that day or it happens the next 12 hours, it's going to be ultimately buying of spot Bitcoin. So if they are out there and they have to get access to spot Bitcoin, they're going to buy it at whatever price people are willing to sell it at. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Demand, the, the price will rise and then people will be willing to, then supply will meet that rise in price eventually at some yeah. point. So that's just the way the markets work. So it's the marginal well, buyers and sellers. And that, that, that image you showed does give us an idea of like, that's the Bitcoin being created. And, but obviously the, the demand side of these ETFs that they're concrete, that uh, the flows are creating is more than offsetting anything that's going to happen on the, the supply side for mining. Also, it just shows us that the having is not going to be as impactful as ETFs as far as I'm concerned, at least in the okay. short term. That's a good statement. I want to jump to a clip here of Vanguard talking about the having real quick. Listen in. Uh, just how much further do you think this has to go and what do you think is propelling Bitcoin right now? I guess I would put more weight on the Bitcoin cycle, which is the having that's happening next month. And, and so after that time period, you see another year of a bull market with typically 20 percent draw, uh, drawdown. So you want to buy the dip. So this is still, I guess, we're in, in, you know, in the Bitcoin cycle. We're still you know, right in the middle of it. Yeah. So, uh, OK, so that was Van Vanek kind of talking about the same same situation you, you kind of were representing. You look at that and then you look at the fees side of this because this is another scenario that plays into this. Vanguard is slashing rates. This is a clip from them talking about this. Listen in. Why slash to zero? I thought waiving fees was kind of a gimmick, but then I saw when all these ETFs launch at the same time, it really matters in the minds of investors. And so we've always wanted to be price competitive. So we joined the party this week. All right. I meant to say Vanek, but the point being is that fees are coming down. Here's my question to you. Does this get ultra competitive and we continue to see a, f a race to the bottom on fees? Yeah, I mean, everyone's at zero right now or were, was at zero. They, they've already, right. some of them have already hit their threshold. Some of them have like, uh, it, they are, it gets really complicated here, but they're, they're basically, there's some ETFs where like once you hit that AUM threshold, whether it's a billion or 5 billion, all of a sudden they start charging fees on the whole lot. Some of them have their, their fee waiver is a little different where they say, once you cross that 5 billion, we're going to charge the full fee on the, anything after that. So there's like this, uh, this mixed rate that they're charging. So for the most part, some of these guys like IBIT are already above their, <laughs> the number where they were offering those fee waivers, but you still get some benefit because they're not charging on the first 5 billion or they're only charging 12 basis points instead of 25. But um, there obviously has already been a race to zero. I don't know how much lower these guys can go. I mean, right now, obviously iShares has a little bit of a, a head start in what they can and can't do. They're over 16 billion in assets. You have you have GBTC, which is launching that Mini-Me product, which is also right. somewhat similar. There's definitely a competition here still happening on fees. And this is something we see constantly in the asset management industry and the TradFi side, whether it's index funds or it's these passive ETFs, uh, even active ETFs. ETFs. That they're, they're, it's the, the person who wins at the end of all this stuff that we're talking about here is the end investor, the people using these products. They're the ones yeah, that win. Sure. So is this, I mean, we keep talking about this. Is this really that important for the mid-size investor? You get into, you know, high net worth individuals or institutional capital, family offices. Yeah. Now we're, now we're talking about real money, real fees. Do you feel like this is really going to make enough of a dent in it for people to do what you talked about earlier, which is migrating from spot over to these ETFs? Will fees um, draw them in? I think, one, some people are I, – I think that it obviously has. I mean, honestly, some of the – like if you were paying somebody to help you set up a multi-sig, like the fees that were – that cost you to do that, right, they were – probably more expensive than he now to be clear there's there's an annual recurring fee so these 20 bips 19 bips it's a recurring fee that you have to deal with every single year yeah. um but it, it i 
I did not think they would come out this low. I thought I thought maybe we'd get something under 50 bips was my my thinking. I did not think we'd have somebody like we have Franklin at 19 bips from from get from day one, and pretty much every single person out there is offering a significant fee waiver, mostly to zero. Um, so this is free access right now for anyone who wants it, um, and that's probably almost certainly has helped driven some of the flows into the ETS. But we also know it's coming from all over the place. It's not just people yeah. shedding other Bitcoin exposures. That is happening. It's happening with international ETFs. It happened with futures initially. Um, it probably happened with MicroStrategy initially. But for the most part, this is net new capital, as you can see what's happening with the Bitcoin price. Yeah. Looking at the comparisons between other successful ETFs, this is the GLD ETF. And you look at the inflows here, daily ETF volume traded by billions. And you can kind of see the, you know, the ETF comes on the scene in January and boom, there it is. Uh, that's the black chart right there. Holy moly. Is this something that just absolutely, at this pace, it replaces or scores so much greater. Do you feel there's a lot of capital coming in from gold right now into the Bitcoin ETF? I don't know about a lot, but I think it's it's definitely taking away some of the demand that would be going to gold. I mean, they're both at all-time highs right now. Uh, right. We can look at the flows into the gold ETFs. They've had net outflows since the Bitcoin ETF launches, so I think there is likely some money that people are allocating away from gold and towards Bitcoin, the digital gold storage. How much of that is actually happening? I'm not 100% certain, but it's happening based on what we're seeing in the data in the U.S. Uh, gold ETFs and U.S. spot Bitcoin ETFs. There's, it's it's not really like defensible at this point because, we, like I said, we're, we're seeing net outflows flows despite gold near at all time highs. Um, how much of that is going to continue? Is it going to completely uh, uh, replace it or is it going to be a complement in a portfolio if somebody's looking for um, something to uh, diversify their fund or hedge against currency debasement? Maybe they're going to use both of these things going forward. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think uh, you're right. I think you're going to probably see a balance between a lot of these sophisticated investors kind of going in that direction. MicroStrategy and BlackRock right now, been on a race, obviously, BlackRock, this is crazy. IBIT now yeah. holding more than MicroStrategy. And this has been going all the way back, I mean, for almost, what, two and a half years for Sailor. And now you've got IBIT coming in and pretty much just stealing the show. Here's my question. IBIT at this rate is going to get to a point where they're basically untouchable in the market for the amount of spot or Bitcoin that they're going to need to have access to for their customers. Where does this, does this go bad with centralization around one of the major asset class holders like a BlackRock holding this much Bitcoin? Um, I don't think so. I'm not a, as a, I'm not a worry word as I know some of the Bitcoin maxis are, they're probably not going to yeah. like this. Uh, but then again, Sailor is a centralized owner of these things. For the most part, the people that dictate what goes on in the actual network are the, the miners and node operators. So like the, they're, they can see what's going on here, right? And also, you kind of want BlackRock in your, <laughs> on your on side, your I side. guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Be your side. Better, your, better, your, better your friend than your enemy. Um, and you got to also realize that it's not BlackRock's money. Right. right, like the way that these this the way that these ownership stakes work, it's the individual investors, the people buying the shares, that have the ultimate what can happen with that trust. So they have a vote in going into like what's going to happen here. Um, so it's really the end investor that owns this. Yes, it's centralized. It's it's more similar to saying, um, is are things too centralized because Coinbase owns so much Bitcoin? Well, yes, technically, but For also. Sure people who are customers of Coinbase have legal rights there. Your rights might even be better with the ETF because right now there's some issues with whether or not your bankruptcy remote in something like a Gemini or a Coinbase because of the way that the SEC and, and the uh, Congress is un unwilling to, <laughs> to create laws around what should and should not happen in these, in these spaces. So, um, yeah, I, I think I think probably some of those concerns are warranted. It's something that I, I would fully expect people to be talking about. Um, it's not something something I'm super concerned. I think we'll see more diversification on the um, custodial side of this thing because really right now, Coinbase actually also holds all the money that's in BlackRock. So it's not just BlackRock holding it, it's Coinbase, but there is yeah. some diversification. Fidelity is using their own platform. Um, some of these other issues are, are, have added BitGo. Um, we'll see what happens going forward if the, how that diversification continues. But yeah, well, really we it's talked centralized to ownership here. For sure. Yeah, we talked to uh, Mike Belshi over at BitGo about this uh, a couple of weeks ago. And to that point, he was kind of on the same boat with you. Hey, this was a tweet from your partner over there, Eric. I believe the new uh, BTC, shares, BTC shares will be distributed via special dividend. So this is kind of what you were talking about over on GBTC. Um, 
the likelihood is that, is this just creating something that's going to be a bit more competitive in the market and that's really the reason they're doing it that's it yeah so um i actually called for this in 2021 uh, not this exact situation, but I've been calling mm -hmm. for GBTC and Grayscale to launch what we call mini-me products. Um, right. So the way this usually works is you have a product that's been out in the marketplace. It charges a relatively high fee because it's from years ago, but it has immense liquidity. So you don't want to give away that high fee. So what you do, rather than letting your competitors uh, steal your assets, you launch a, comp a competing product at the low fee. Yeah. What yeah. Grayscale is doing here is actually better for investors than what I was basically suggesting that they should do. Um, they're gonna basically allow you to get exposure to this in what should be uh, a non-taxable event. So like Eric said there, it'll be a, um, a special dividend type of situation, a spin-off. So if you own, let's say $1,000 of GBTC, we don't know the percentages of what the ticker BTC will be. We don't know what the fee is gonna be. I'm expecting the fee to be competitive in that 20 bips, 25 bips range. Uh, maybe even lower. It might be lower than all the other ones. We'll see. And they'll say, we're going to spin off 25% of GBTC into this. So basically, you'll get a blended expense ratio that's much, that's much lower than the 1.5%. You'll get um, a tax-free event to get exposure to that ETF that's low cost for people that are stuck yeah. there and don't want to pay capital gains. And then you can do with the rest you want. So if it's, say, it's 30%, if you have $1,000, you're going to end up with $300 in BTC, and then you'll have the remaining $700 in GBTC. Again, we don't know yeah. the percentages, we don't know the fees, but that's what's going to happen. And I think it's a nice middle ground where Grayscale doesn't have to completely decimate their revenue and their business um, because once you get used to charging 1.5% on tens of billions of dollars, it's hard to yeah. completely give that up. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, that's a that's a money printing machine right now when you look at Grayscale. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. Uh, this mean, was a I tweet. Mean, yeah, go ahead. They've had, they've had over uh, almost $11.5 billion in outflows. Um, when they launched, they were at 20, 28.5 billion in assets. Mm -hmm. yep. They've had 11.5 billion in outflows. They have 28.2 billion in assets right now. So the price appreciation has completely saved them. Their revenue in dollar terms has, has done very well. Yes, they've lost 30% of their funds, 30% of their Bitcoin or over 30%. Um, but as far as their dollar revenue is concerned as an operating business, it's pretty stable. <laughs> yeah, only hurts them if we see some sort of cataclysmic crash, obviously, because then it's about you know the control of the funds. Uh, this was a tweet. We'll, we'll move on to Ethereum now. And this was a tweet you put out. This Ethereum ETF cycle feels like the opposite of Bitcoin uh, ETF approval odds at the moment. What we see here, don't see and hear, I am a little bit less optimistic. So that being the case, 73 days away, when you tweeted this, uh, I think you had uh, like a 35% positive probability or no that was eric that had one at 35 percent. are you guys yeah both we're both at 35 okay. percent yeah we were arguing between 40 and 30 and we just went 35 essentially is what All it right. came down to um so uh, uh yeah we're in the same we put those odds out where we debate it before anyone type puts it out there for sure why go 35 percent? what is it that you're seeing that is materially different different now with you know what the sec is responding to around this versus what we saw with the, the Bitcoin ETF. Yeah, so the main reason we went to 90% for Bitcoin ETFs in early October was for a multitude of things. One, it was the court case. They won the court case. The SEC decided not to appeal. But the real key factor was that the SEC decided to give comments on the S1 documents or prospectuses. Okay. That was a completely cha completely new pattern. We have never seen them do that on the Bitcoin ETF. So that indicated to us that they were working on this and if they wouldn't be wasting their time working on this if they weren't going to approve it. So the first actual filing was from ARC on like October 11th, I think. Um, and we heard rumors in the weeks leading up to that, that there was comments coming in and there was feedback going back and forth. Right. We're hearing the opposite here. One, we're not seeing any documents. That was 91 days. We saw the first one before the ultimate deadline. We're 69 days out now, right? So um, there's still no movement. Um, we're hearing that the SEC has not given comments. We're hearing they're not really interacting with any of the issuers off the record from different people. We're not hearing much. Basically, we're not hearing anything. Whereas... Anytime we heard something the Bitcoin ETF or we talked to people kind of involved in the situation, it was giving us more and more uh, hope and security in saying that we thought this was going to happen. Whereas ETH has gone the opposite direction. If you talked to me a month ago, I would have said 60%. I was cautiously optimistic. That's what I had been saying on Twitter and other podcasts. Um, but we're just not seeing anything. And we've heard anecdotes that the SEC is just not giving comments. That said, the flip side to this argument we have seen some amendments, but those amendments are not indicative of conversations with the SEC. 
the amendments are more just indicative that um, these issuers are getting these spot Ethereum ETF applications in line with the lessons they learned from the Bitcoin side of things, right? So they know the SEC has like hard lines on like what they do and don't want with these digital assets. There has to be some unique stuff with ETH because ETH and Bitcoin are not exactly alike, but there's a huge yeah. amount of overlap. So the amount of time you need to interact with these issuers in the SEC to get these documents lined up for Ethereum should be less than Bitcoin. That said, like I said, we're at 69 days now. They started 91 days out at least, probably more 100 plus days out um, on the Bitcoin side of things. So. Uh, and we're not hearing any indications of that changing, but that could change. The minute we see amendments that are indicative of the SEC having conversations, our odds are almost certainly going to have to flip beyond 50%, but we're not seeing any indication of that right now. Okay, so that's interesting that you said that in the sense that could there be one little nuance that is a bit different here, but at the same time, it could be a, a bit more uh, quickly uh, decided just because of some of the work has been done before, similar, but not exact. But uh, Christopher Perkins, he kind of hit on this. And I think this is one of the questions I have. Do you feel that the benefit of Ethereum having a yield product out there already could be causing maybe a little bit of caution with the SEC? Because they've already shown heavy uh, trepidation toward yield products. What are your thoughts? Yes, I think that's part of it. One of the other things that I am confident in, so I'm unconfident in whether or not we're going to see an ETF approved. Like I said, we lean towards it not happening, but 35% is not zero. It's obviously not 90% yeah. either. But um, I do think I'm fairly confident that if we do see these spot Ethereum ETFs approved this year, May 23rd or in 2025, um, they won't have staking. They will not be able to stake. So that will be make them right. less uh, maybe uh, – interesting to investors when compared to actual yeah. spot ETH in the way that there, that's not an issue for Bitcoin. And like you said, the SEC does not like staking. We, just, we saw that yeah. with the Kraken situation. We see that now with Coinbase and other others. Mm -hmm. So they're not a fan. That said, I do think the SEC in its actions over the last couple of years has um, basically de facto accepted or implicitly accepted uh, Ethereum as a commodity. So it's pop, I, it'll be interesting to see if they do deny May 23rd what they use. I personally don't think they're going to go out and call ETH a security. Uh, I also don't think they'll ever call it a commodity because if the mm -hmm. SEC comes out and just basically admits, yes, it's a commodity, then all of a sudden you're going to have every other project that you're they're suing right now saying, oh, well, we, we did exactly what ETH did. It's the same thing. Yeah. You said this was a commodity. So the SEC is just way better off with ambiguity around ETH than they are trying to claim it's a security or um, – a commodity because they try to claim a security. They have issues with the CFTC. They have issues with the entire industry. Um, it'll it'll be interesting to see. Well, you you mentioned you know some of the benefits if if this were let's assume that we you know it's a perfect world we'll get an ETH ETF uh, it does come through maybe in the light of no staking involved you, but you look at investors that would look at this asset class maybe a bit differently. Well, I think they would for sure. One thing you would compare to this is ultrasound money. This is just showing right here. I'll kind of zoom in on that right there. That's the current total uh, in terms of returns on yield. Now, granted, yeah, that's only on spot. That's But people would look at that. And then if you go further up here on annualized profits of the Ethereum Foundation, what this means is gas fees. You look at, um, I mean, look at that. That's Intel. Uh, you've got Apple, Netflix, Tesla. And then right out there, I mean, ETH is off the chart right now. Uh, for obvious reasons, you know, with the, the growth of what's been happening in crypto. But people would look at that and say, wait a minute, I kind of recognize those companies. These, this one little, you know, blockchain is making more than all of these Fortune 500, you know, S&P 500 guys. So that I think would be an interesting question as to would people select the ETH ETF over a Bitcoin ETF? Do you think they're sophisticated enough for that? So two answers here. One... No, I don't think they will. And that's more anecdotally because a lot of the, like we talked about at the beginning, a lot of the people buying this are uh, the real focus here is on the investment advisor community for the Bitcoin ETFs. Mm -hmm. That would be the right. focus for the Ethereum ETFs. For the most part, they weren't even ready for Bitcoin ETFs as evidenced by the price and the flows that are coming in. Um, and digital gold is a much easier narrative to sell than 
the complexity of what Ethereum is and what, what Ethereum is doing. And we've seen it in products with TradFi overlap. Um, you look internationally, you can see Bitcoin ETFs have way more demand than Ethereum ETFs. We see it, we saw it here in the US with Ethereum futures versus Bitcoin futures ETFs. Um, so I, everyone keeps making these arguments with to me and to Eric that Ethereum ETFs are gonna be a bigger deal than Bitcoin. And there's nothing to indicate that is the case. Um, so right now I think uh, Ethereum's market cap is like one third of Bitcoin. I right. think that the demand, so I don't think a spot Ethereum ETF launch would be a flop. Like some people seem to think that's right. going to take. No, I think it'll be an extremely successful launch. I think it will attract significant assets. But I think the amount of assets and flows it will attract will be less than that ratio of market cap. So right now it's like 30% or whatever it is. I think we're probably looking at maybe it'll attract 20% of the assets, something like that. Eric thinks like 10%. So it, it's likely to be much less. Now change over time as people get more comfortable with digital assets, more begin to uh, dive deeper into to what Ethereum is and how the, the blockchain actually works, maybe. Right. Uh, but near term, I do, just don't see it overtaking uh, Bitcoin in interest with the TradFi community, at least to start. Well, this is going to be one to watch. And of course, everybody's going to be uh, ears glued to Bloomberg for how this is going to play out. So if you guys want to follow Mr. Seyfert right there, you can. J-S-E-Y-F-F over on Twitter and X. Uh, catch him there. Hey, James, it was great having you in again today. Thank you so much for your insights. We appreciate all the work you guys are doing over at Bloomberg. Thanks for stopping in. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's always fun. You ask, you ask great questions. Very, very good, detailed questions. We'll see you soon. All right, you guys uh, tuned in, maybe over on the audio side of things, make sure and jump over here on this side of the house. And that is the video side, which is where you can catch everything over on YouTube at just Paul Barron Network. It's very simple. And of course, if you're not in our Diamond Circle, get in now. It's a great place to get additional content and info from us and our research team. Plus, you can always find me on X at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechBath.